Now broadcasting from beautiful downtown Tallahassee, it's Classic Movie Reviews with Snark. Welcome to today's show. My name is John. As always, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes or follow the links to social media in the podcast show notes. You can also go to snarkymoviereviews.com to read notes, bios, and other random movie thoughts. I'm sitting here with my oxygen tank, eating cough drops like a fat kid eats M&M's. So I apologize for my voice and I hope to make it through. Today's film is one of the greatest film noir classics of all time. The movie is Out of the Past, 1947. The movie is based on the novel Build My Gallows High by Daniel Mainwaring. The film has a super talented cast. In an article titled 200 Cigarettes, Roger Ebert states that Out of the Past, 1947 was, quote, the greatest cigarette smoking movie of all time. The trick, as demonstrated by Jacques Tourneri and his cameraman Nicholas Musacara, is to throw a lot of light into the empty space where the characters are going to exhale. When they do, they produce great white clouds of smoke which express their mood, their personalities, and their energy levels. There were guns in Out of the Past, but the real hostility came when Robert Mitchum and Kirk Douglas smoked at each other. Unquote. I was first introduced to this movie through its remake, Against All Odds, 1984, which will be covered in the next episode. Watching Out of the Past, 1947, cleared up some odd plot holes in the remake. Robert Mitchum played the role of Jeff Bailey slash Jeff Markham. Mitchum is not only a great actor, he is a manly man. Mitchum was born in Connecticut in 1970. His father was killed when he was very young, and he grew up as kind of a wild boy. Moving around from family member to family member, he had his first road adventure at the age of 12, where he rode the rails, worked for the Civilian Conservation Corps Relief Project, and earned money as a professional boxer. At 14, he was arrested for vagrancy in Savannah, Georgia, and served time on a chain gang. Mitchum said he escaped and returned to his family. In 1936, he headed to California, again hopping trains. Mitchum made a living writing, and he became involved in local theater. He also made money as a bit player and stagehand. In 1940, he got married and took a steady job in an aircraft factory. Shortly thereafter, Mitchum had a job-related nervous breakdown. He began working as an extra in film. He continued to get better roles, such as playing one of the pilots in the Doolittle Raid biopic 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, 1944, with Spencer Tracy. His performance resulted in a seven-year contract with RKO. His next major role came when he was lent to United Artists for the William Weldman directed The Story of G.I. Joe, 1945, where Burgess Meredith played war correspondent Ernie Pyle. After this movie was completed, Mitchum was drafted into the Army. Mitchum began acting in film noir and hit it big with Crossfire in 1947, Out of the Past, 1947, and the Raoul Walsh-directed Pursued, 1947. Just as Mitchum's career was hitting high gear, He and an actress were arrested for possession of marijuana in 1948. A big deal at the time. Mitchum spent 43 days on a California prison farm. His conviction was vacated in 1951. Many years later, Mitchum told interviewer Robert Osborne that his arrest was a studio publicity stunt. Mitchum's next studio releases were hits, including Rachel and the Stranger, 1948, The Red Pony, 1949, and the film noir The Big Steel, 1949. Mitchum paired with Marilyn Monroe on a raging river in River of No Return, 1954. That same year, Tracks of the Cat, 1954, was released. Tracks of the Cat was the only film ever directed by veteran actor Charles Lawton. In this black-and-white movie, the only colored object was the red coat that Mitchum's character wore. In this movie, I thought Mitchum played pure evil until the next year. The Night of the Hunter, 1955, featured Mitchum as a sadistic bluebeard preacher with love tattooed on one hand and hate on the other. Lillian Gish is amazing as a shotgun-toting defender of two children against the killer. Mitchum turned in a super performance in Thunder Road, 1958, where he not only acted, but produced, co-wrote, and purportedly directed. Mitchum starred in three movies with Deborah Carr. The first of these was Heaven Knows Mrs. Allison, 1957 where Mitchum played a Marine stranded on an island with a nun played by Deborah Carr. In one of my personal favorites, The Enemy Below, 1957, Mitchum's character is the skipper of a destroyer, locked in a death match with a U-boat commander played by Kurt Jurgen. 
Third film featuring this pairing was The Sundowners, 1960, where the two played Depression-era Australian sheep farmers. Mitchum played a general on Omaha Beach during D-Day in the movie The Longest Day, 1962. I would have followed him. That year he played another evil character as the vengeful rapist in Cape Fear, 1962. Things slowed for Mitchum during the late 1960s, and he turned down several roles that would go on to be iconic. However, in El Dorado, 1966, he turned in a stellar performance as a drunken, down-and-out sheriff as he co-starred with John Wayne. Mitchum continued to turn in quality performances through the 70s and 80s. These films include Ryan's Daughter, 1970, The Friends of Eddie Coley, 1973, The Yakuza, 1974, and most importantly, the epic World War II drama Midway, 1976. He was great as Bill Murray's boss in Scrooge, 1988. Of course, I have just hit the highlights of his films as there are so many more good features. Mitchum continued in film until the 1990s. A heavy smoker, he died of lung cancer in 1997 at the age of 79. Jane Greer played femme fatale Kathy Moffat. Greer was born in D.C. in 1924. As a baby, she was winning beauty contests. Later as a teen, she started singing professionally. At 15, a palsy paralyzed one side of her face. She had to do facial exercises and she claims that the exercises helped her develop her expressiveness. I agree. I had this in the ninth grade, and now people claim I am crushing their souls with my facial expressions. When I had it, I had to go in and have a Frankenstein-style electrode hooked to my face, and then they would hit the button and make the muscles twitch. Greer also had a very expressionless face, and it was said she had a Mona Lisa smile. Greer was spotted by Howard Hughes in a 1942 issue of Life magazine. She was lent to RKO a lot and made many good films. These films include Dick Tracy, 1945, Out of the Past, 1947, They Won't Believe Me, 1947, The Big Steel, 1949, You're in the Navy Now, 1951, The Prisoner of Zenda, 1952, Run for the Sun, 1956, and A Man of a Thousand Faces, 1957. In 1984, in Against All Odds, a remake, she was cast as the mother of the character she played in Out of the Past, 1947. Greer continued to work mostly in television until 1966. She passed away in 2001. The great Kirk Douglas was cast as Whit Sterling, the gangster that sets everything into motion. He was covered in Episode 4 in Harm's Way, 1963. Rhonda Fleming had a small role as the tax lawyer's secretary, Mita Carson. When Fleming graduated from Hollywood High in 1941, she was already working professionally. Her first large role was in Spellbound, 1945, directed by Alfred Hitchcock. Other movies include The Spiral Staircase, 1946, Out of the Past, 1947, A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, 1949, While the City Sleeps, 1956, Slightly Scarlet, 1956, Gunfight at the OK Corral, 1957, and The Big Circus, 1959. She continued to work until 1990. Paul Valentine played the role of Joe Stefanos. Valentine played Councilman Weinberg in the remake Against All Odds, 1984. Dickie Moore played the role of The Kid. The Kid was deaf and didn't speak, but could sign and read lips. Moore was born in 1925 and was a hugely popular child star. He was in the Iron Gang series and had over 100 roles total. He had four important roles early on. These are as Marlena Dietrich's son in Blonde Venus, 1932, with Barbara Stanwyck in So Big, 1932, with Walter Houston in Over the White House, 1933, and with Spencer Tracy in Man's Castle, 1933. Some of his greatest roles were as a teenager, such as in Sergeant York, 1941, and Out of the Past, 1947. Moore retired from acting in the late 1950s, and after battling with booze and drugs in the mid-60s, he started a public relations firm, which he ran until 2010. Moore died in 2015 at the age of 89. Teresa Harris played the role of Eunice Leonard, Kathy Moffat's maid. We discuss Harris in episode 42, I Walked with a Zombie, 1943. The story. Bad guy Joe, Paul Valentine, drives to Bridgeport, California, and stops at the local gas station. 
He is looking for the owner, Jeff Bailey, Robert Mitchum. When he gets out, the kid, Dickie Moore, is working with his back turned. When the kid doesn't respond, Joe thumps a match at his head. The kid can neither hear nor speak. He does communicate that Jeff will be back later. Joe goes across the street to Marnie's Cafe. Jim, Richard Webb, pulls up in a state of California sedan. They don't really say what his job is, but it causes him to travel frequently. Marnie, Mary Field, throws out a statement that Jim's girl, Ann Miller, Virginia Houston, is keeping time with Bailey. Is Marnie causing trouble or trying to score a man? Jim plays it cool. When Jim leaves, Joe chats Marnie up about Bailey. The kid goes out to the lake where Ann and Bailey are fishing and talking about their future together. The kid signs out a message to Bailey and they head back to town. Joe is waiting when Bailey gets there. They know each other. Joe tells him that Wit, Kirk Douglas, Bailey's old boss, wants to see him in Lake Tahoe. Bailey takes Ann on the trip with him. Bailey tells Ann his real last name was Markham. On the trip, Bailey tells about the man he used to work for, partner Jeff Fisher, Stephen Brody, and how he became involved with Wit in New York City. Wit had recently been shot by his girlfriend. Joe is there and he's a real hothead. A guy can't even get shot in his own apartment by a dame without the whole town starting to buzz like a... Let go. Thank you. Smoke a cigarette, Joe. You just sit and stay inside yourself. You wait for me to talk. I like that. I never found out much listening to myself. Witt says she ran out after she shot him with $40,000 of his money. Witt offers Bailey $10,000 plus expenses to bring her back. The girl's name is Kathy Moffat, Jane Greer. Still in flashback, Bailey goes to a Harlem nightclub where he talks to Eunice, Teresa Harris, who used to be Kathy's maid. She tells Bailey that she got sick from her shots and left for Florida. Well, I can't say much. It was no cold place, though. That girl sure hated snow. Them clothes she took. She was looking for sun. Florida. You sure about that? No, I seem to remember. And I'm sure. No trunk? She only took suitcases. You sure again? I know, I weighed them for on the bathroom scales. How much did they weigh? 131 pounds. Exactly? Exactly. On account of that's what I weigh myself. Of course, Bailey knows you don't have to take shots to go to Florida. Maybe you should to keep the snowbirds out. Bailey uses the weight of her baggage to trace Kathy to Acapulco, Mexico. Bailey waits every day in a cantina until she shows up. Near the plaza was a little cafe called La Manasura, next to a movie house. I sat there in the afternoons and drank beer. I used to sit there half asleep with the beer and the darkness. Only that music from the movie next door kept jarring me awake. And then I saw her coming out of the sun. And I knew why we didn't care about that 40 grand. He strikes up a conversation. And when Bailey says he has been down for 10 days, she knows he is from wit. As she leaves, she tells him about another place called Pablo's, where she goes. Bailey doesn't let Witt know that he has found her, but he waits at Pablo's until she showed. She shows on the second night, and the pair begins keeping time together. After he kisses her, she asks when he is taking her back. She thought Witt was dead. She says she didn't take the money and begs Bailey to run away with her. The pair continue an affair for several days. Bailey falls pretty hard for Kathy, but she's a gamer. Bailey tells Kathy that he will take her away for a new life away from Witt. In the morning, Bailey is packing when Witt and Joe show up at the hotel. Bailey tells Witt that Kathy slipped past him to South America. Bailey tries to quit, but Witt won't let him off the hook. Bailey and Kathy slip north and start living in San Francisco. Bailey's old partner, Fisher, sees him at the racetrack. Bailey and Kathy have to split up, so he goes to L.A. and she stays in San Fran. After Bailey shakes Fisher, he meets Kathy at a rural cabin. However, Fisher is still on the trail. When Fisher shows up and demands money, the two guys get into a brawl. During the fight, Kathy pulls a gun and kills Fisher. Kathy runs out, leaving Bailey with a dead body. Bailey finds the bank book showing that Kathy has indeed stolen the 40 k Switching back to current time, Bailey tells Ann that he buried Fisher's body at the cabin. Ann drops Bailey off at Witt's estate. She says she wants him to come back. Witt tells Bailey that he wants him to steal some records from a tax lawyer named Leonard Eels, Ken Niles, who is blackmailing him. Bailey refuses the work, 
But as he sits down to breakfast, Kathy comes to the table. She has run back to Wit after Fisher's murder and has told him everything. Wit says Bailey owes him and must do the job. Bailey is instructed to meet Eel's secretary, Mita Carson, Rhonda Fleming, concerning the job. Kathy comes to Bailey to apologize, but he says she is like a leaf that blows from gutter to gutter. I had to come back. What else could I do? You can never help anything, can you? You're like a leaf that the wind blows from one gutter to another. You can't help anything you do, even murder. You can't say it was that. I can say one thing. I buried him. Bailey knows that Kathy has told everything to Wit and that he is being set up. He leaves a note for Anne and heads to San Fran, where he meets with Mita. She explains the plan, and he gets his cab driver buddy to take him to Eel's house, where he meets the tax lawyer and Mita. He tries to break the setup by staying, but Mita ushers him out. She sends him back to his hotel, but he and the cabbie drive around the block and see Mita coming out with the records. Bailey goes back to Eel's apartment and finds him murdered. Of course, Bailey's prints are there from the first visit. Bailey hides the body. He jumps in the cab and goes to a house where Kathy is staying. Bailey tells her that Eels is not dead. Under questioning, Kathy said she signed an affidavit that Bailey killed Fisher and now he will be charged with Eels killing as well. Kathy says if they get the papers from Mita, they can have leverage over Wit and be free. She sends Chump Bailey off to a club to retrieve the tax records. Joe comes in and he tells Kathy that he has killed Eels. Bailey gets the records from the club and drops a package off at his hotel. When he gets outside, Joe and another man are waiting in the cab with his friend. They take him back to the bar, and when he gets there, Kathy is with the manager that Bailey stole the records from. When they open the folder, Bailey has replaced it with a phone book. He says he wants Kathy's affidavit from Eels' safe. Mita will have to open the safe. As he watches the building from outside, the police show up. Bailey heads back to Bridgeport, and the newspapers say Jeff Bailey is wanted for two murders. Kathy has ordered Joe to follow the kid. Anne waits by the river for Bailey, and Jim comes and tells her she is a fool. Joe follows the kid back to where Bailey is hiding. As Joe aims at Bailey, who is hiding below, the kid snags him with a fishing hook and causes him to fall. Bailey goes to Witt's estate and takes Kathy down to meet with Wit. He tells Wit about Kathy's double cross and the death of Joe. Besides, it's not a frame. She shot him. He was going to kill you. You see, with self-defense, a sense to beat, she might not even have to do time. How say you killed him? They'll believe me. Do you believe him? Go on, Kathy. Tell him about Joe. What about Joe? Where is he? Last time I saw him, he was in the East Walker River. I didn't send him after Jeff. It was his own idea. Bailey tells Wit that Joe can take the rap for killing eels, and then later committed suicide. He also says if Witt destroys the affidavit and hands Kathy over to the police, he will return the tax records. Bailey thinks he is out of the trap and heads back to Bridgeport, where he meets Anne. They profess their love, and as Bailey is leaving, Jim shows up and tries to reason with Bailey about Anne. Bailey heads back to Tahoe and finds that Kathy has murdered Witt. She tells him he could come away with her and Witt's money or take the rap for all three murders. I never told you I was anything but what I am. You just wanted to imagine I was. That's why I left you. Now we're back to stay. And I have nothing to say about it. Well, have you? Wit's dead. A bundle of papers isn't any good. If Joe was around, you could use him, but Joe's dead too. So what are you going to do about eels and fisher? It's not matter what are you going to do about this. Someone has to take the blame. If nothing on me, but I'd make a fine witness for the prosecution. Don't you see you've only me to make deals with now? He says he will go away with her. It is interesting that the dress and head wrap she is wearing is reminiscent of a nun's habit. While she is packing, Bailey calls the state police and tells them about her. I guess he has a three murder limit on his girlfriends. As they drive down a dirt road, there is a police roadblock. When Kathy sees it, she shoots Bailey in the side. That's four murders. They open up on her with a Thompson and kill her before the car crashes into the roadblock. After the news gets back to Bridgeport, Jim offers to take Anne away. Anne asks the kid if Bailey was really leaving with Kathy. The kid lies and says yes so Anne can get on with her life. The kid waves by to the sign on the gas station. Anne and Jeff drive away 
and I guess live happily ever after. It does get a little twisty turny at the end. Film critic Bosley Carruthers wrote, quote, If we had some way of knowing what was going on in the last half of this film, we might get more pleasure from it. As it is, the challenge is worth a try, unquote. World famous short summary. A woman murders three people before her bay thinks it might be a problem. Okay, folks, it's time to sign up for my email list as the free EPUB will be ready shortly. It has around 200 pages, has 50 reviews that are cleaned and cross-referenced, and has original artwork. If you want a copy, it's completely free to list members. If you enjoyed this week's episode, please tell your friends. And if you really want to help, drop over to iTunes and give me a review. If you want to comment, recommend the movie, or just say hi, follow the links in the show note to my site. I have speak pipes so you can leave audio feedback as well. Beware the moors.